Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. Today, we have a wonderful show for you and a show that will apply to every single parent out there, I'm sure. I wanted to do the show because I needed help from our guest, Dana Abraham. She's the author of Calm the Chaos, a fail-proof roadmap for parenting even the most challenging kids. Dana, thank you so much for coming on to teach me what you have to teach me. Well, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, the title of your book is even calming. Calm the chaos. I love it. Um, But I, I think every parent listening knows exactly what we're talking about when they read the title of your book. I have chaos in my life and it's coming from somewhere. And often, usually, It comes from a relationship with one of your kids. And you um, talk right at the beginning of the book about that kid. And that is the kid who is just going to give you trouble no matter what. So tell me about what you mean when it comes to that kid. Yeah, so when I think of that kid, one, I was that kid growing up. I'm raising three of those kids now. Um, But that kid is typically the kid that other people will describe as too much of something or not enough of something. So they are too loud. They're too wild. They're too boisterous. They're too defiant. They're too bossy. They're too emotional. They're not uh, paying attention enough. They're not trying hard enough. They're not showing up enough. They're not, you know, whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. And Typically, they are the most misunderstood kids, and that's why they're showing up in the way that they are. But under the surface, these kids are absolutely beautiful and amazing kids, and they have so much they want to share with the world, but they might not have the skills yet. They might not have the ability, or the world might be mismatched to them. And so there's a lot to learn from these kids, and there's a lot to help these kids with. I love it. You know, I often tell parents or people there, I have never seen or taken care of a kid that I didn't like. And I've taken care of some really hard teenagers in my day. Now, I'm not a counselor. I'm just a pediatrician. But often we're the doorway to the counselor. You know, a parent will bring a child and go, help. I don't know what to do. Um, and so I've, I've seen that. Um, I'm intrigued for you to to hear you say that those kids are very misunderstood because I think one of the challenges for parents is to figure out where is this coming from? Why does my child, I have a very bossy grandchild and she's just like her mother was and it's hard for them and it's hard to parent because if you tell her, stop doing it, you don't need to be in charge. I'm in charge. I can make sure your siblings eat what they're supposed to eat. She erupts. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and just kind of goes crazy. And I think, what happened? What just happened? So talk to us about what happens to a child when that storm hits or when something hits them the wrong way and they just lose control. Yeah. So, you know, one of the misconceptions is that these blow ups, these meltdowns, they are coming out of absolutely nowhere. Mm. And What's really happening is they're building up under the surface. They're feeling misheard. They're feeling misunderstood. They're feeling undervalued. They feel a lack of control, um, which you're with your granddaughter. It really sounds like she's feeling like there's a lack of control or a lack of her own autonomy and safety. And the best way to take control of her life is by taking control of other people's lives. Um, and you know, we like, You know, when I think of, and I'm jumping a little bit here, but just to help with your granddaughter here, you know, I think of people and kids who are all about the other people following the rules and the other people doing what they're supposed to and kind of, you know, bossing others around is on the flip side of that is they are your biggest social justice warriors. They're all about things being fair and things being right. And they want, they want to make sure that the whole world is right. And so if we can hone in on that in the right space, then we can almost thank them. Thank you so much for trying to help. Right. But um, but your sister's doing this in her way and that's okay. I don't I don't need your help here, but here's how you can help me. Um, But in that moment isn't when they're ready to hear that, because 
if they're controlling in that moment or if they're bossing in that moment, it's because they're feeling dysregulated. There's something under the surface that's causing them to feel like they need to take control. Mm -hmm. And so by adding more input, the no, don't do that, or I'm the parent, I've got this, don't boss them around. They're taking that almost as an attack on themselves, mm -hmm. on who they are, what they're doing, how they're showing up. Now, when they're five, they are not cognitively doing all of that, but mm -hmm. that's what's happening under the surface. And so you get this big eruption. Mm -hmm. So in the heat of the moment, it's more for the parent, for the adult in the situation to ride out. We call it riding the storm. And that's mm -hmm. that first phase of just I'm going to ride through this. This isn't about solving, fixing, getting them to change their behavior right now. That doesn't actually happen until much further down the the path here where we have a better relationship, where the child feels seen and heard. The child feels like they can speak up for their own needs in a way where others will hear them and where the parent or the adult in the situation understands where this is coming from. And in the heat of the moment, you just can't do that. You can't ask questions or, you know, dig under the surface. You can't um, because usually parents are too emotional and parents are very frustrated and angry. And they're wondering, what is happening here? Am I a bad parent? Because that's what parents do. And in the moment when my granddaughter erupt, I'm thinking, what am I doing wrong? I'm clearly not doing it correctly. So you really have to do it later. Um some kids, and she is one of them, will actually just start crying for for half an hour over something like her mom said, sorry, you can't watch that show. Mm -hmm. And she'll cry and cry and cry. She's not being bad. She's just mm -hmm. like hypersensitive to it. But I think that makes sense. If she feels like she's never in control, what are some of the most common ways that you have seen kids erupt and become chaotic. When you talk about the storm, what do you typically mean? Yeah, so storms can look different for every family. And when we start about, when I start the book off and I talk about these stages, um, storms can also be that parents are going through a storm, meaning one of the parents just got laid off. Um, one parent is exhausted because they just had a new baby. One parent is not getting good sleep, right? So there can be storms that are not related to the kids. Um, but when we talk about storms related to the kids, what we're talking about is um, they can be these big explosive behaviors that are hitting, kicking, yelling, spitting, uh, running away, these big dangerous, scary behaviors. You can also have storms that are just you know, one of the most common ones I hear is, you know, if I say no, my child erupts. If mm -hmm. um, if I ask my child to do something, they say no. Um, and, you know, that just like what is seen as outright defiance. And yeah. I'm just not going to do it. And if you ask me to, I'm going to explode. Um, or I'm not getting my way, so I'm going to explode. And the explosion for these children a lot of times sound like uh, yelling. They sound like uh, saying no, running to the room, maybe even crying, like you said. Um, and then you've got storms that can be these big emotional outbursts of they touched me. They looked at me wrong. I didn't get the food you want. You said you were going to get me. And and so those feel like very, you know, large explosions of emotion and crying and just that woe is me. Um, and then you can also have the child where the storms look like wild and crazy behavior. They're the kid that's climbing on the furniture. They're the kid that's jumping on the couch. They're the ones that when um, guests come over, they're saying all those inappropriate things. And you are just like, oh my gosh, we can't go anywhere. We can't do anything because my kid is the one that's going to be acting out or touching others or doing, you know, we had a, a parent in our community just the other day go, I don't know what to think. I just got a call from kindergarten and my kid showed his bum. Like, what am I supposed to do? Right. Like, that's a storm when you're having to figure out how to deal with it, what to say, what to do, how to work through it. We consider those storms and there's all different layers and levels of storms. You know, I think you're 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 talking to 90 plus percent of the parents out there, because as you're talking, I'm thinking these patients I've had that, um, you know, are struggle with this. One, one mother recently called me and was hysterical because her 
six-year-old eats so much, her five-year-old just compulsively eats so much so that if she goes over to a friend's house, the kid will look for things to eat and even go into the mother's, you know, the friend's mother's purse to find things to eat. And if Mm -hmm. mom says, no, you can't do that, you can have only one cookie, he goes crazy. She can't even take him Mm -hmm. into the store. And I didn't know what to say. (laughs) So, you know, so what what would you say to a mother doing like that? Like, (laughs) like, my kid is out of control behavior wise in front of other people and it's embarrassing and I can't take them anywhere. So if they came into you, Dana, and um, where would you begin with that parent? Oh, my goodness. One, I have so many questions um, about that particular situation. I have so many questions because when a child is hoarding food or is needing that much food, I wonder what basic needs are being met. Is there something that's going on under the surface that is causing that child to just have this insatiable appetite? I also wonder, is there a trauma past? So um, we see with foster or adoptive children that... um, the children will hoard food because they're so afraid that there's not going to be enough. And yeah. so by being told, no, you can't have any more, it really feels like the end of their world. And it feels like they're really not going to have enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have so many questions. I, and the reason I mentioned these questions is because there isn't a one size fits all solution. There isn't a quick tip or trick. And so when I start with parents, I'm always starting from a place of curiosity. I want to learn more about their unique family, Mm -hmm. but I'm listening for their mindset. Mm -hmm. I'm listening for if this parent is talking about this child wanting this food, is the parent more upset because they feel embarrassed that this is happening in front of other people? Is the parent upset because they're worried this is an eating disorder? Are they upset because they feel like their kid doesn't respect them? And so if you can listen for the language that the parent is using, then I, it's, it's really easy to get started there. Because as parents, if we come into it resentful, frustrated, upset, um, fearful of something that might happen 10 years down the road, we're going to show up very, very differently. So when my son was really aggressive. And that's where a lot of this started. I was an educator. But then when he was in second grade, he was getting kicked out of school. And he would have explosive meltdowns that actually ended us in the emergency room several times. And when that was going on, if I called it an attack or abuse, then my brain immediately went into protection mode. And it went into a reactionary way. But if I was able to swap that thought and anchor myself in, okay, he needs me. Like if he could be communicating in a different way, he would. And And what would he be saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like what would he be saying right now instead of, I hate you, you're the worst, you're you're the most terrible parent ever, you know, I wish you were dead. Things like that that are really hard for a parent to hear. Um, And I would just swap it in my head. And so that's what I would suggest for a parent is in any situation is first check your own, like, what are your thoughts and what is something you can tell yourself that's going to help you stay grounded to get through that moment. Right. And I do think embarrassment was Mm -hmm. was one of the big things, because when I've seen talk to parents whose kids act up in public, it's just very, very embarrassing. I'm curious when you went into the emergency room with your son. Um, how did people look at you? I think that has that was one of the hardest things. And that's why I got into what I do and is because as an educator, you know, the kids that struggled were my favorite ones, but I still know how many times I judged the parent yeah. without even meaning to. And so once I became a parent, I'm going to be the world's best parent. Someone's going to show up with like a check one day on my doorstep with balloons and, you know, confetti and like, you win the award. No, that didn't happen. (laughs) So um, instead, I've got the kid who's getting kicked out of preschool and then getting in trouble at kindergarten and then getting suspended in second grade and then getting kicked out of, you know, third grade. And this was at this point, he was in fifth grade when we were at the emergency room level. And so I had dealt with a lot of, if you just did this, if mm-hmm. you just tried this, if you just oh, were stricter, I know, you know all it's- that. And like, um, we even had been um, 
released from his child psychologist and said, at this point, there's nothing else we can do. At this point, it's a parenting problem. Mm. And so at that point, as a parent, you do feel hopeless. You feel all alone. You're left to feel like you're the only parent going through something like this. You feel like you have let it get too far. Um, you know, there's all this doubt. But the truth anger. is, you were trying so hard. Oh, every I was trying year. everything. You're, you're doing everything you possibly can, and you're trying to understand what's happening, and you're trying to respond in the, in the right way. And you're right. Parents can be so mean to other parents without even knowing it. Um, so what did you, what did you learn from that? And, and how did you, how did you process the healing or the help that, or the, that you had to give your son? Well, I think first of all, I learned that no one else was going to come and like give me all the answers, right? I was, I was looking for all these answers somewhere. And there's lots of, lots of different avenues I could take, but really my son just needed me and he mm -hmm. needed me to hunker down, figure out what was going on and see him for who he was. So that was my first step. And my second step was really just creating, I created a community around me. It's why I definitely, I created this community so that I could share what was going on. And I thought I was the only one. And I learned that there's millions of parents out there mm -hmm. going through this every single day, feeling like they're the only ones. And it might not be as extreme as what I just described, but there's parents who feel like there's this misconception out there that if you're struggling as a parent, then you're a bad parent. And right. if your kid is struggling, then you're oh. a bad parent. Mm -hmm. And it's like, neither, you can be a great parent and still struggle. You can be, have the most amazing kid and still struggle. And so that was one of the biggest aha moments for me is let's remove that shame, that guilt, that blame, and let's get curious. How can we understand what's going on here and build a relationship that's built off of compassion and understanding? And then we can get to all that structure and strategies and all the things that people start with. But let's let's instead start with the base minimum of let's have a good relationship and let's make sure everyone's safe. Yep. I love it because the shame factor is huge. Because every parent whose child is struggling um, feels so ashamed and they try to hide it. They don't want to talk about it. And yet it comes up over and over again. Mm -hmm. You have five stages to mm -hmm. calming this chaos, and this is lovely because you've been, you've been there, you know. So, so what you're talking about is very, very real and authentic. Stage one is surviving the storm, and you say get everyone to safety. So, how do you do that when you when your son was erupting? How does a parent get everybody to to safety? Yeah, and by safety here, I mean emotional, psychologically, and physical safety. And so if you're dealing with really explosive things, we created a Ride the Storm plan that um, is actually not talked about much in the book, but it's an emergency plan. So everyone in the house knew what they had to do, where they went, down to, we're going to lock the dogs up, right? Like we knew exactly all the steps to take and we practiced it out of the moment when we didn't need it. So my eight-year-old and my two-year-old would go to the basement and they'd watch TV and they'd eat popcorn mm -hmm. and so that they weren't around. And my husband and I had a tap out system and we had, if it gets to this level, we use this medication. If it gets to this level, we call the ambulance. Like mm -hmm. we kind of knew the different stages that it needed to get to. Um, but in the book, when I talk about that ride the storm plan, it really is first getting the adult to safety themselves. Because if you're triggered as the parent, if you're feeling dysregulated and you're in that protection mode, then you're going to end up adding more to the situation. And we do do that by stopping, like not jumping in and fixing, not talking, not moving. And even if our kids are running away, the first thing I hear is like, yeah, but I have to jump in because my kids are fighting with each other. And it's like, a one second pause is not going to make or break that that argument. Mm -hmm. So pause so that you are not adding and jumping in and being part of the fight. And then take a big deep breath in so that your brain gets oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said earlier, anchoring yourself. So that's yep. that first step. 
And then the second step is actually doing what I call a body scan. So you're taking from head down and you're just looking at your own body language. So if your jaws are tight, if your mouth is clenched, if you're huffing and puffing, if you're saying things like, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing that? I've told you so many times. We don't do that in this house. All your kid is hearing or feeling is more attack against them. Mm -hmm. And so the behaviors are just going to explode even more. And Mm -hmm. so it's about removing that in this moment. You're not allowing. You're not letting them get away with it. You're just not adding to the situation. I think of it a lot like a tornado, right? You're not trying to outrun a tornado. You're not trying to tell the tornado to go away. You're not trying to tell the tornado to stop destroying things. You are hunkering down and waiting till it passes and then coming out and saying, okay, let's assess the damage. What happened? How can we reconnect? How can we repair? It happens after the storm has passed, especially when you're first getting started. You need that plan until you have a plan that works. That is so hard. It is. And it is so hard in the moment um, mm-hmm. to to stay calm because usually it, it presses all the bad buttons in a parent and we just explode. I mean, there's a lot of emotion going on in, inside of us um, that I think is probably more complicated than we can know, at least for me. Um, so I, I love that. So you ride out the storm and then you talk about um, your energy reserves, which mm-hmm. I love. Stage two. Uh, energy is huge. And if you're an exhausted parent um, and and another one of these comes up, you're like, I can't do this. How am I going to do this? So talk a little bit about energy and and, and how we can preserve it so that we can withstand another because another is going to come. I mean, absolutely. It's going to take a long time to 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 quiet this down i imagine yes um yeah it doesn't it doesn't change overnight and i think that's mm -hmm. another one of these misconceptions that has come from so many like influencers in the parenting space of like here's a quick tip here's try this do this and so parents assume that things should change overnight and when they don't change overnight they feel like they're failing and and that's just not the case this takes time this is we want it to be lasting change and lasting change takes time And so you're so right with this energy thing is that you can ride the storm for just a little while, maybe through three of those in a day. But by the time the fourth one hits, you're like, I can't do this. Like, I'm done. And you end up losing your cool. And so the way to combat that is once you've got a plan that's working for you to ride it out, you want to start working on a plan to rebuild your energy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people think that means getting away from the kids, taking time away, going out with girlfriends, having like, you know, a spa day. But this is stuff that you can do with your kids right beside you. Mm. So I call it a five-minute energy plan. And it is this like daily taking care of your own mindset. Because if you've got all these emotions built up, all these triggers built up, you want to be working on that on a daily basis. I kind of say practice while you pee. So like, Every, you want to be practicing that True. anger yeah. when you don't need it, you know? Right. So when you're washing your hands or you're doing the dishes and you're looking out the window while you're doing the dishes, that's the time to envision the next meltdown and what you're going to say and do. Mm. And so that's all a mindset piece. And or it's like just, you know, saying to yourself, I'm I'm exactly the parent my kid needs. And then rebuilding your energy by connecting with other humans, not just kids, not just watching Bluey all day, but like actually texting your mom or texting a friend or you, I like to do voice messages um, because texts can overwhelm me sometimes. And so I'll send a voice message to a friend and it's just 30 seconds. And then when they have time, they'll send a voice message back. So I have that adult connection Mm -hmm. um, and that can boost our energy. And then the next part is about, um, I find so many women lose themselves, women especially, all parents, but especially women lose themselves in parenting. And so they don't know what lights them up, what excites them, what brings them energy or what's draining them. Mm -hmm. And so this energy plan is all about just identifying just one thing a day that boosts your energy. Like for me, that's just standing outside in the sun getting Mm -hmm. outside at least once a day. We were talking about why I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. And part of it is being surrounded by nature. 
Like yeah. being able to see a cardinal come to my window, that's a boost for me. And it happens on a daily basis here. So that is something that I really value. And then removing drains. Um, it can be as simple as unsubscribing to all these extra emails. I've been going through some overwhelm lately, and I have been Instead of aimlessly scrolling on TikTok or Instagram, I'm spending that same amount of time just hitting unsubscribe on all the emails that are coming through. I mean, I don't need a house. Why am I still looking on Zillow? Um, I mean, I think we all have this like, <laughs> obsession with Zillow, oh, right? I am. Yeah. I'm obsessed. I send my kids, oh, here's a link to a house near you. Not that you're looking, but sure. not that you're looking. Yeah. Mom, leave, leave me alone. Yeah. So I'm unsubscribed finally from Zillow and all those other things. Like I'm not in the shopping mood. I don't need to be subscribed to all these places. And so even removing that drain can really give you energy back. It's giving me so much time in my day because when my I look at my email, there's no new emails in there. Yeah. Whereas before, the minute I walked away from my email, there was new ones. And Starting. that's draining. And then, um, and so the more that we as, as the parent can find these little ways of boosting our energy and taking care of our own body, so that last piece is like activating our body, um, and I'm sure as a doctor, you would agree. Like, I, I just feel like as women, we don't take care of our mental health. We don't take care of our physical health. As we're getting older, we have adrenal stuff. We have hormonal stuff. If we're not taking care of that, how are we supposed to show up for our kids? Yeah. And so that's that's where that energy plan kind of comes in. You know, I love it. I, I've often said to younger parents, fatigue, to, from what I see, is the number one um, in impeding factor in great mm -hmm. parenting. P parents mm -hmm. are exhausted. And if you don't sleep and, you know, and a lot of mothers feel they need to be attached to their babies 24 seven for two, three years, you know, you, you're, you're done, you're, you're fried. And so to sort of say, it's really healthy for you to say, okay, I'm going to step into my garden and garden for half hour. You need to sit quietly in your room or whatever. Um, it, because that fatigue is is really overwhelming. So talk about the role of other women in helping you, because I find, A, sometimes other women can be a drain. You know, if you're one of these people that's constantly trying to fix everybody's problems, it's exhausting. So, uh, you know, is it is it helpful to have one or two women friends who go, I get it, I'm here, what do you need? Um, or, or any kind of community there? I mean, I find that having a community that gets it is really powerful. Um, you know, inside of our community, I like to brag. I think it's one of the best communities on the planet, but um, mainly because as a, an adult with ADHD, I am like, I understand that sometimes it's draining. I also understand that sometimes I can get sucked into reading everybody else's posts. And so I will tell people it's not a tip for TAC community here. Just because you need support today doesn't mean you have to then go support five other people because you did. So you can so, just post. You can like yeah. post and run. Like you post and what, then you What can, is our deal? What is our deal? Because you're feel absolutely like right. Like, we got to get back. Like it's just, yeah. You feel guilty. You okay, do. Thank you so much for helping me. Now I got to go make dinner for 15 people. Yeah. I mean, what is no. that? That's another book. It There's is, another book is. for you. There we go. Yeah, book. this like, yes. You know what? It, I think it really comes down to like, it, it comes back to where we were talking about your granddaughter, right? I love that she speaks up because the opposite of that is people pleasing and it's doing what everybody else wants you to do. And so you grow up as like an adult and then you're just giving to everyone else. Yeah. Like, so there's plus sides to what your granddaughter's doing. Well, and I, I, I will tell you, and I tell, tell parents, I love strong-willed kids. Mm -hmm. Strong-willed kids are going to be the kids that get in your face. Yep. Um, but these are the kids that are going somewhere because they're determined and, you know, but their will is working against them in the early years. Um, so talk about now you go on to stage three, the calm at the center of the storm. Sure. How do you get there? So um, so you get there by going through those first two stages. If you're exhausted, you're not going to be able to stay calm. You're not going to say things that help diffuse the situation. Um, I think of adventure movies um, when I think of this stage. I think of, um, there was that movie ages ago, I'm dating myself, but like, I think it was like 90s, early 2000s, where there was like a, it was 
a bus and they were trying to defuse the bomb on the bus before it blew up. I can't even remember. It's like Tom Cruise and Sandra Bullock or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, they did not go to the bomb and talk down the bomb. Like they didn't go and say, you know, I need you to stop doing that. Can you please stop ticking? Like they did not talk to the bomb yes, to get it to yes. stop. And mm-hmm. so, you know, in any of those movies, they've, they're have they being very meticulous about which wire they touch, which words they're saying, like how they're dealing with this thing that's about to blow up. Yeah. And they're trying to minimize the damage if they don't get to it fast enough. So they're getting all the people off the bus. They're all those things. And so the calm and the storm, because you've done these other stages, so you've already found a way to anchor yourself. Mm -hmm. So you technically are already kind of able to ride through the storm. You got a little bit more energy in your tank. Now, since you're regulated, you can make a plan for what to say and do and how to show up in the heat of the moment. So this is where you're actually making a very set plan. If you know that you've been dealing with... um, like, let's say, let's say you're the granddaughter, right? Like bossing. So yeah. what am I going to say and do the next time that mm-hmm. she is bossing her, you know, sister or brother around? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm going to come up with a phrase. So I might say something like, I notice that you want them to follow the rules, mm-hmm. right? And then I'm going to uh, do something. So I might move closer. So instead of saying that from the other room, like mm-hmm. instead of saying, stop bossing your sister right. around, I might yeah. move next to her and I might sit with her, you know, and say, sweetie, I noticed that you want your sister to do, you know, to follow the rules. Mm-hmm. But what I also notice is they're doing things their own way. Yeah. And so, right. And so you, you're kind of na- narrating the situation. Um, And keeping your words to a minimum, um, because Mm -hmm. again, you're trying to minimize the damage here. You're not trying to fix. You're not trying to solve. You're just trying to minimize what is about to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you are saying, you know, I think we need to just take a break so your sister can finish what she's doing. Why don't you come with me and we'll cook together? Or why don't Mm -hmm. you come with me and we'll take a break together? We'll read our book together. Or you can show me how you'd like to get it done. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and like that, that takes a lot of discipline because sure. usually in that moment, you're angry. So it's hard for a parent to say, oh, you know, you just did it again. You did it again. And I'm so angry and I got so much to do to, to sort of stop and say, OK, let's go. Let's go over here. That, mm-hmm. that really takes training. I it think. does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And that's why we start with the roadmap the way we do. And each of the plans that we're kind of talking about. There's a four-step process for each Mm -hmm. of those stages. And if we were just talking about what to say and do at each stage, it would be really hard to do. But we also, every plan starts with our mindset. So the mindset in this one is we call it thought monsters and super swaps. So Mm -hmm. you get, and again, you're doing this before the moment happens. You're not doing this. You're not coming up with a plan in the heat of the moment. You're Mm -hmm. sitting down and you're saying, if it's happened before, it's going to happen again. So let me go ahead and make a plan for how I'm going to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So I know my, instead of thinking, man, she's so bossy, I might say, wow, she, um, she really needs control. Like Mm -hmm. when something's going on, she needs to feel in control. Mm -hmm. So if you know she needs to feel in control, that you'll show up a different way. Yeah. And then connecting is that getting closer and, you know, kind of shifting your body language the understanding piece would be um, we have a whole system for helping you understand what's under the surface, but is she tired or hungry? Um, is she missing connection? Is she wanting to connect with the sibling, but she doesn't know how? Is she um, lacking a skill needed to be mm-hmm. able to handle this situation? So maybe a negotiation skill, communication skill, maybe she's um, lacking the emotional regulation, something like that. And so Then when you get to the point of like, so you're going to be curious, hmm, I wonder why she needs so much control right now. You're not going to solve it, but thinking Mm -hmm. that's going to allow you to say, I notice that you want your sister to do something a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why that is. Asking the child doesn't help, I have found, but because they don't necessarily know what's going on inside of them. No, no. Yeah, she doesn't yeah. know right now, and especially younger children, they don't have that metacognition to right. know why they think what they think. 
um, or why they do what they do. But over time, the more you are narrating, I notice this is happening, then the more they're going to start to use that language. Um, I noticed that, you know, I noticed that my sister doesn't, um, doesn't use a napkin when it's, and I don't like that because I'm worried she's going to get um, syrup all over the table right. and then it's going to be sticky. And I don't like when things are sticky. Yeah. So she's yeah. going to find her language because you've been narrating it along the way. You know, it sounds complex, but it's, it, it, in, but it is kind of simple in a way, but it is complex. But, um, so, I mean, we only have a little bit of time and I, and I failed to say it in each of these stages, you do have an acronym, um, YCUE. You know, you connect, understand, and empower that you sort of walk through under every single stage. Mm-hmm. So you really break it down even a lot more than we're doing here. Um, stage four is no more storm chasing. And then um, stage five is building a storm proof infrastructure. So um, can you just talk to us about how you build that infrastructure? Is that kind of what you've been talking about all along, like plan, plan, plan? Yeah, it does build up. And biggest thing that I think since we don't have a ton of time, the biggest thing is this is what most parenting books talk about is building routines, building structures, building rules, building boundaries. Um, And most advice out there is to start there. But Mm -hmm. what we've been talking about is let's build emotional safety. Let's build relationship. Let's build trust. Let's build communication. And then we can worry about the structure And we can make sure that the reason I call it an ecosystem is you're creating systems that work for each family member. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that you can, you know, we have an agreement. When we are frustrated, we say these things. Or when we disagree, we both take breaks. Like you can create these agreements that you build ahead of the time or in the moment, whatever that is. And those become part of your family success plan. And it becomes kind of your operating manual for what do we do when plans change? What do we do when we have a disagreement? And how do we operate in those situations? And you're building it one step at a time, not jumping to that and trying to build it all at once. So, and my, and then backing up just a little bit, you talk about the whack-a-mole, which is, I think, where most parents are. You did it, wham, you did it, okay. Okay, now I'm going to take your cell phone away. Okay, you did it again. Here's what's going to happen. You did it again. Here's, and it doesn't seem to work. I know our granddaughter do- doesn't respond to that very well um, because strong willed kids. And also, um, you don't want a kid to grow up feeling like a bad kid. And I think that mm-hmm. sometimes if they're whack a mold enough, I mean, h- how do you, how do you have a child? Excuse me. How do you have a child that's sort of constantly getting kicked out of school and and da da da, da and, and grow up without feeling like a bad kid. I think at first they're going to start feeling like a bad kid and mm-hmm. so you have to again you're you're narrating and then out of the moment you're you're unraveling what has happened where did this build up and you start to get so my son you know fast forward to 11th grade and he, it was towards the, or 12th grade, it was towards the end of last year because he graduated. And um, I get a call from school and he's gotten in a, a fight is what they said. But once I got there, he starts unraveling the whole thing. And so he goes, mom, I just misread the situation. And I was like, okay, can you wow. tell me what happened? And um, good, yeah. Yeah. So what had happened is he, his coping strategy in classes that he didn't connect with the teacher was to get on a computer and watch shows and things like that. So we had come together as as a staff and as a team to say, what can we do to get him more engaged in classes? And so he was on board. He was ready to take his classes seriously. And so they had an assignment where he was paired up with a kid who kept falling asleep. Oh. And so he said, and so he's like, I'm trying to do my job and you're falling asleep. So much like your yeah. granddaughter, like, this is not fair, right? This is not fair, yeah. This is not fair. So he was like, look, if you don't wake up and do this with me, I'm going to pop you on your head. And the kid said, you better not. I'll, I'll hit you if you do. And my son thought he was joking. And so my son just like tapped him on his head. That's all he did. He just like tapped him. The kid got up punched him on the side of the face. My son picked up his backpack, 
And he said, I misread that. And he walked out of the classroom and went to the office. Wow. Like, that's the difference yeah. when you've been narrating and you've been working on ahead of the moment and you've been helping him understand like how his brain works and yeah. where his, you know, where things come from and, and how to navigate these situations. It's not that they're always going to go away. He's still going to have stressful moments. But now he's able to say, mom, you know, my brain works this way. Or mm -hmm. mom, you know, I need you to give me an answer, not say maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. things like that. So he's able to advocate in such a big way that he doesn't take it personally. Right. That's awesome. I, I, and I think probably with practice, it gets better and better and better. He can do that a lot better in 12th grade than he could when he was 11. Um, but, but it is a lot of training. Um, the book is Calm the Chaos, a fail-proof roadmap for parenting even the most challenging kids. And my extraordinary guest has been Dana Abraham. Boy, I, we could just go on and on and on because I have so many more questions. Um, but you talk about community. Talk about other than writing the book, what else can or do you offer parents and where can they find out what you offer? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at, um, at, I have my own podcast and then I'm on all social channels at Calm the Chaos Parenting. Mm -hmm. And then we offer lots of free workshops. We also have a, a membership that we call the library, um, our huddle membership, where we have done for you in the moment and ahead of the moment plans. And then we have our full program and membership where we support parents and walk them through this entire roadmap step by step and coach them through how to adapt it to their unique family. Awesome. And where do they find that? The best way to find us is go to, like I said, any of the social channels, go to the podcast, go to Calm the Chaos Parenting. Okay. I love it. Calm the chaos parenting. It's, uh, as I said at the top of the show, it just makes you feel better when you, when you say it because it becomes a reality, reality. Yes, you can calm the chaos because I think so many parents feel like there's no help. It's, there's nothing I can do. And I just don't know where to turn with this out of control child. And that's a wonderful place that anybody can, um, can turn. Dana, Thank you so much for joining me today. I love the work that you're, do, uh, that you're doing. I hope that everybody goes and listens to your podcast and reads your book because it's so important, not just that, that our kids are living in chaos and things going on internally, but there's so much chaos around us. And I think that we all need, we all need to learn sort of the calming of the chaos inside each of us. So thank you for teaching us so much today, Dana.